Welcome back to Rethinking Politics. Today we're going to be discussing the first presidential debate. Now we've looked forward to this because we wanted to get into a lot of the issues, and it just seemed wrong to start talking in depth about an issue when it's going to be presented in the very near future in one of these debates. And when it's presented, we then use that as a starting point for the discussion to talk about the practical policies surrounding the more theoretical base that we always dive into. Mm -hmm. And so we were looking forward to this, not because we thought the content was going to be great, but because we wanted to get into the issues and because we wanted to talk about the same topics in different and better ways than what they were going to talk about. If you watch the debate, you probably know where this is going. <laughs> At least you would think that you know where this is going, because we're going to agree with pretty much the rest of the world that it was bad. It was bad. The debate was terrible. <laughs> it was it was bad on a scale that is hard to believe and in ways that it's hard to believe from grown men. For for those of you who didn't watch the debate, you know, there you know, I, I watched the debate with a group of people and there was a discussion afterwards about who won the debate and who did the best job and 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 those are all questions that you can definitely ask. But at a certain point you start slicing hairs when you talk about who won the debate because neither candidate did a good job. Neither candidate was exemplary. The the back and forth arguing, the bickering, the 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 nonsensical statements, it was hard to watch. It was definitely hard to watch. Now here's where we disagree with some of the other people who are talking about the debate. And it's in, it's in one fundamental way, because I think we can all agree that this debate was bad. But the thing is, is this debate, well, it was truly a circus. But it was. But don't let that fact distract you from how inconsequential basically everything they talked about their, during the debate actually was. Just because this debate was a circus doesn't mean that that was the only problem with it. It wasn't, and it really obscures the more important problem, which is what Brad just indicated. You, This debate could have been much more organized, you know, structured much better. They could have taken turns. They could have not bickered. They could have been, could have been kept their yeah, cool. It could have been much more civil and respectful and and well articulated and clearly organized and it still would have been awful that is the argument that we fundamentally disagree with with a lot of the other people who are talking about this debate is that the main problem with this debate is not the bickering and the arguing but the fact that what they're actually talking about as they're arguing is almost completely meaningless and that's not unusual the, yeah. the the bickering maybe that in itself is arguable, but uh <laughs> right the bickering we would at least say that the bickering is a little bit worse, if not significantly worse than other debates. Yeah, depending on which debate you're talking. Depending about. Depending on which debate you're talking about, which time there are old debates from long ago that were this bad. <laughs> People think that this is like uniquely bad. It's not, but it is. It is very bad. It's unusually on that bad. Scale. Yeah, it's unusually bad, but. It is the substance of what they're talking about that is the fundamental problem. That this could have been that this could have been the best debate in terms of, of respect and civility, and it would have still been garbage. It would have still been a waste of time to listen to. Here's a little bit more about what we mean. What we're saying is that if you go back eight years and you rewatch, you know, Obama and Romney going head to head in their debates. Their debates are going to be a lot more civil than these debates, but they're going to be talking about not the same things, because obviously this is a totally different political climate than it was eight years ago, <laughs> but they they aren't talking about a lot of the things that they should be talking about. And of course, it's going to vary debate to debate. Here's, an, here's, here's a more specific example. There were six segments in this debate, and each segment was about a question. 
and how well they address the questions is one thing, but what the questions actually were is another. Because I remember when they, when when Chris Wallace, the host, announced his first question, I'm like, okay, it's a warm up question. You know, let's get these guys talking, get this party started, and then we're gonna we're gonna get to the to the heavier stuff, right? Warm up question, get them ready. But then he kept asking warm-up questions. It never substantially changed. So I went and grabbed the, the six questions that he asked and and looked at them. The first question was about filling a court seat, you know, Supreme Court seat during an election year, right? What everyone's talking about, which, of course, makes sense. Second question, handling of COVID going forward. What are they going to do if they become president? Third question, the economy. And I'm like, yes, the economy. But here's the question. Which is it? A V shape or a K shape? Ooh, shapes. I love shapes. Tell me about triangles. Fourth question, race relations. Who will handle it better? And that one on its surface seems like it could be pretty substantial. Go ahead and listen to that 15 minute segment and listen to the things they talk about. They spend half of that segment arguing about whether or not they support law enforcement. I thought we were talking about race relations. Uh, fifth question, talk about your records. <laughs> they spend most of that section talking about the other person's records and, and forget that they each have their own. And then the last question was election integrity, where they're talking about the mail-in ballots. And, and that one is, once again, where they talk about what the other person has said at some point and, and rarely talk about what what they actually believe about the election integrity. But even as they do, it's it's not really about any major issue. And so you look at these six questions and you look about how they talked about it. And there were a couple of points where they got close to something serious, like with the economy and with race relations that are actually close to real issues that people seriously care about. And each time, they darted away to something less substantial. And that was the debate. That was the debate. Anytime we got close to something real, it ended up getting sidetracked to somewhere else. Yeah, because cause any one of those could be interesting, and you could get into the things that matter. Uh, the court seat. You could talk about the structure of the Supreme Court and the role it plays in the government right now and what you think that your vision of that should be in the future and how how that impacts the government and on and on. Yeah, but the question of of whether it's okay to to, to have someone re- fill an of empty court seat, not only is it not, as Dan said, that interesting, but it's already been addressed by both sides. They've both already mm-hmm. made their statements. Mm-hmm. And in mm-hmm. this debate, they just repeated what they've said before. There was nothing new. Or, or, yeah. or the economy. Here's, here's why I think the shape thing is so stupid. Because it's not about whether or not the economy is a V-shape or a K-shape. They're just discussing how well they think the economy is doing. And using that as some kind of litmus test for which president you should elect. No, what we should be talking about is what the president is doing that affects the economy. It's not about whether or not the economy is a V-shape or a K-shape. It's about what principles do you believe in about how the economy works and how will those principles affect your policies as president. That's, and that, how those policies in turn affect the economy. Exactly. Yeah, it's, That's it's, the question I would want to ask. The fact that they somehow managed to not discuss that is is truly impressive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like the fact that they can dance around an aspect connected to some of these important issues without without taking a stand on any principle related to it. And even not even on specific practices going forward most of the time is it seems like it shouldn't be possible (laughs) (laughs) like like do are we here to talk about what you were going to do and why you think that will work or not because i I thought that's what we're here to do Mm -hmm. i want i want biden to make a case whether he thinks trump should appoint a judge that he disagrees with their perspective i don't care what he thinks the role of the Supreme Court should be in the balance of the federal government and and what 
how that impacts the government broadly and what role he thinks the president should have in that and what what his philosophy is of how a chief justice or uh excuse me what his opinion of what a justice what makes a good justice would be useful information mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um you know what he thinks the issues the court should concern itself with and, and those kind of things would be would be interesting to know and I would love to hear him and and uh, Trump describe their differences, discuss them, and and have a back and forth on that. They don't. They're talking. They're talking about how exactly they can posture in relation to appointing a judge right now mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that would score votes. That's that's what they're talking about. Handling of the COVID going forward. I would love to. This one almost got to a point where it was. Substantial, like you said, at one point they brush up against some underlying principles. One of them's like Trump's like uh, the people want to go back to work. They want to do these things. Give them freedom. And Biden's like they don't want to be at risk from these diseases. You got to give them safety. And like for a moment there, like if you yeah, that's, started there, that's a real question. Is is what do you believe about freedom versus safety? That's a real discussion that these two candidates really should have that would help clarify mm-hmm. what they believe in and who you should vote for. That would be yeah, useful information. Right. As it was, they, one of them clearly emphasized, they each emphasize one of them more than the other. But you'd think that what they're presenting is a dichotomy, safety or freedom. And that's that's a false dichotomy mm-hmm. if there ever was mm-hmm. one. <laughs> You can have you can have both, and you can have them both, and you can emphasize both in different ways and at different times. And if they were to get into that and say, look, I think in these issues, Trump could say something like, I decided that because of the different circumstances in different states and different areas that the best plan was to let them decide at a smaller scale, which is what he did, right? He let these these uh, the governors decide with their states and, and allowed for a lot more freedom in the decision-making process rather than imposing a uniform thing initially. That's an interesting question. Okay, why, why do you think that works better? Mm-hmm. Why would that work better? And how has that played out? And how would it play out versus if you had emphasized it slightly differently, you know, or put more weight on safety than on freedom? And that would be an interesting discussion that they are not, they don't seem capable of having. They're at least not interested in having it. Maybe they're capable, but they're certainly not interested. No, and I think it definitely comes down to to the interested. It's it's not – they don't think it's beneficial to their election to discuss those issues. And and it's <laughs> – it, it reminds me of what we talked about last week about, uh, you know, political incentives and – about disconnecting controversial issues from yourself, that keeping a distance between you and the things that can turn away voters. And that's something that you see in this presidential debate is is most of the time what they're trying to do is bring up controversial things and try and associate them with the other candidate, which, of course, Mm -hmm. in this case, mostly means he said, she said, you know, you know, Biden at mm-hmm. one point said this. Oh, well, Trump at one point said this and and trying to remind us of the fact that the other person is really associated with all the bad things in the world. And our candidate is associated with none of the bad things in the world, which is not <laughs> what a presidential <laughs> debate should be about. That was so often what it was reduced to. You'd think like like topic four, race relations and, and how that should be handled. Of all of the things that's been discussed in the last couple months, uh, that one has been one of the most prominent, uh, right up there with the COVID-19. And you'd think someone who had been paying any attention at all could have developed some thoughtful ideas about this topic, things that perhaps the police could reform on, things that perhaps relations are tense about that have been misconstrued. Things that, you know, broad opinions about some of the theory being proposed of that we discuss in our episode on on racism, the different definitions of racism and how they're competing, and how depending on which one you believe, you're going to have widely different interpretation mm-hmm. of some of the mm-hmm. events that are happening on the ground. And what they're reduced to in this debate is, Biden, why don't you support the police? Why won't you 
<laughs> Why won't you say that you're against rioting? Like, as if those are questions that matter at all. And yeah. they, they, they matter in a very, 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 very small way. And it's what Brad said. If you associate these controversial stances with certain people, it might alienate some of the voters that they're hoping to. It used to be like rather than trying to persuade people that your stance is correct, you're just trying to make it as vague as possible so that you have nothing substantial which they could say could be incorrect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're trying not to present anything that might be controversial and so that you can you can get broad support based on people's assumptions about you yeah, rather than the specific things that you're willing to do and that you've actually said and actually believe. You just don't want to, to shake their assumptions. And the best way to do that is to just attack your opponent. Yeah. You don't even need to present it. Yeah. Say, say as little as possible, as vaguely as possible, and then try and throw dirt on your opponent. I think I've heard this song, actually. It doesn't talk less, smile more. <laughs> you know, we should do an episode about that. Episode on Hamilton. <laughs> the musical. No, and it worked. And it's, I was going to say it works. It worked. It worked for a time. This is the thing with, with these political strategies that politicians are, are using. With the, with the development and refining of political sciences ideas about getting people angry, getting them afraid, uh, attacking your opponent. It works, but will it work forever? Will it work in the long run? Is it better in the long run? Is the effect of it really going to be what you want? That's another question altogether. Those are right. Those are questions. W will it win this election? And by this election, I mean any given election, mm -hmm. it might. Mm -hmm. And there's, and especially when they first started doing it, it was extremely effective. If you weren't doing it, you were going to lose to the people who were. Mm -hmm. But more and more, people are not. People like us, people who are looking at podcasts online to get opinions about the news instead of turning on MSNBC or Fox News or some of these other things, are have had enough of being manipulated and put through you know, in, in these political games. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, and, and, and there's an argument to be made for for the fact that Trump is president right now because there was a group of people who were fed up with with the politicians who were standing up there and speaking for an hour and a half and not saying anything. And they're like, Trump is someone who will actually say something. And and the thing is, is 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 seeing this debate and part of the reason I think we assumed that more issues would be talked about is because we thought Trump was just going to go out there and say it. You know, he'll say the thing. That's not what I saw in this presidential debate. I saw Trump trying to be very careful about about <laughs> the things that he said. And and that's 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 not that's not the brand that he's that that he's he's presented himself as it was it was surprising actually that that Trump appears at least significantly more than he was 4 years ago to be playing the game he's trying not to say things controversially you know yeah. Biden would ask him questions and 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 throw things at him and he would he would try and be diplomatic in his in the way he phrased his responses he was you could tell that he mm -hmm. had been coached on the right words, as we talked about before, the right words to answer that question so that you don't alienate people. And and they were mm -hmm. both playing the same game. They really were. Yeah. They were. That's a good point. I hadn't even thought about that because I'm so used to debates. That's, that's, that's normal. how debates are. They're playing the game. But mm -hmm. but that's not what you'd expect from a Trump debate. You'd expect Trump to go up there and, and say whatever he was thinking. Right. You were You were saying that people afterward always ask who won the debate. Always. That is, that has got to be my least favorite question about <laughs> in, in regards to these debates. That's the, that's the bit that I'm always, it, it upsets me because how do you, how would you measure how they won? Well, I'll tell you how they measure it. They measure it. They being anyone who participates in this game and plays this game, they, they, measure it by whether or not you 
avoided losing voters, <laughs> whether or not you avoided the controversial being being labeled, whether any yeah. of the labels stuck to you. Yeah, yeah. Did any of the mud thrown at you stick? Who has the who came out the least muddy? Yeah, as a game of verbal dodgeball. <laughs> it is verbal. <laughs> Who was able to That's dodge brilliant. as many hits as possible? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Who took the least hits in this verbal dodgeball? No, I mean. Verbal dodgeball. <laughs> I, saw, I saw something interesting yesterday. You know, Trump has tested positive for COVID. And I was curious what Biden's response to that would be. And I saw an article and the headline was, you know, Biden as a response to, to Trump testing positive for COVID is going to temporarily suspend his negative ad campaigns against Trump. And, and I thought it was the funniest thing. And I and it, it took me a minute to figure out why that was that was so startling for me to read that. It was this idea like we know what we're doing is gross. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's it was almost like this idea of you know, what we do in our campaign, what both sides do is we just throw mud at each other all day and all night. And we say anything we can think of to hurt the other side. But, you know, Trump's Trump's sick and he could potentially die. And we don't want us to be actively besmirching his name if that happens. So we're going to pause for a minute. As soon as he gets better, we're going to start throwing <laughs> him under the mud again. And and of course, you know, Trump's campaign is doing the same thing to Biden. It's not just Biden who's throwing dirt. It's, it's the game. It's the game <laughs> that we're playing. And even suspending that negative ad campaign is a calculated mm -hmm. move as part of that game. As part of the game. It's right, all right. just part of it the game. It would look terrible if he was harassing him as he died. No, that it would, would look be, awful. It would be awful. And it also is cruel. It's, like, it's kind of a win-win for him. <laughs> <laughs> he gets to look good and seem kind and and uh and also not yeah not make himself look bad yeah no and it's just it's just it's all just just part of this game yeah and people are surprised at how many politicians uh from from very different viewpoints are actually friends with each other not just cordial to each other but actually friendly um including like the the bushes and and the and the obamas is a good example you look at the way they interact and you would think that that's not possible. Yeah, you you would you would assume that's not possible. <laughs> yeah, the relationships they often have outside of their public their public personas is uh is indicative of the fact that they know it's a game. Yeah, it's, and I was about to say Biden and Kamala, and, right? And, Biden and Kamala, the fact that they they can work together and not have a problem and are probably the relationship's probably fine despite the serious mud flinging mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. dire accusations about the character of of Biden thrown by Kamala. Yeah, because it's it's a game. It's a it's a profession. It's a profession. It, it would be like lawyers who who serve in a case together on opposing sides, but are still mm -hmm. are still you know colleagues or even friends who get along. They're like, I understand that that you know you've got your side and I've got my side, and and, yeah, and it's fine. And it's not really about the sides. It's just where I happen to, to, to sign up for my job, you know? I decided to run as a Republican. You decided to run as a Democrat. I thought I could, yeah. thought I could win here in this area as a Republican. And thought you could win there as a Democrat. I have no, no beef with you. It's the, it's the generals <laughs> in war too, right? The mm -hmm. Generals are often very respectful of each other while their soldiers are <laughs> killing, killing each, each other. Killing each other and dying. Oh, my so goodness. the issues. We want to talk about the issues that we wish showed up. I'm just going to list <laughs> our, our, our wish list. These are the things that we're like, we want to do an episode about this because it would be interesting. And this wish list is, is more than just our wish list. It's things that people are very concerned about. And so we assumed they would bring these things up. It wasn't just that we want them to talk about them. We've got other things that we'd love them to bring up that we know they're not going to bring up. You know, there are things, there are issues that we care about that, that simply <laughs> aren't going to get brought up. That we realize that very few other people who aren't spending lots and lots of time in politics don't care about. Don't care about. But, <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, there's a reason we talked about restorative justice earlier. It's because we knew restorative justice wasn't going to get brought up. That's... <laughs> That's not going to get brought up. That's not an issue that everyone cares about. But there are issues that everyone cares right. about. Right. No, not everyone can. It's not even a question of does everyone care about it. No one's even heard, heard of, of it. Heard of it. Yeah. You'd have to be looking to find mm -hmm. a lot of the most interesting and useful solutions to problems. 
So these issues are issues that everyone cares about, not just us, as Brad said. We, we, these are things that make a big difference in the day-to-day -day life. These are things that, uh, that we're going to have and a big impact on the country going forward. These are the things that are going to be decided, hopefully, in the legislature, but <laughs> <laughs> going forward and going to be determined largely by the presidents in these these big elections, right? As they get they get as they take control of the different houses and and the presidency and ha and can impose their vision on a few issues. So immigration was number one. We've wanted to do a podcast on immigration since we began this podcast because there are so many things about immigration that we don't think people who aren't looking would would see and hear mm -hmm. about and would learn mm -hmm. about. Not just facts, but ideas about it and how it works and how it interacts with economics is, I think, so poorly understood generally that I would love to talk about it. And we assumed they would. We assumed that, that at some point it would become it would become a substantial issue in this election and it it has not as of yet and and the thing is is we we put off recording an episode about immigration because we assumed it would be discussed in this election and it would be a fantastic segue because it is worth talking about <laughs> right right we'd want uh, we prefer to talk about things that everyone's already interested in and focused on right rather than just the, the things that bring we're it out of the in. blue hey, here's another issue Wealth taxes. This is something that's been proposed a great deal. How do you how do you deal with inequality? There are a lot of people who, in polls, will say inequality is the biggest problem facing America. Um, I, I don't. At least there were before COVID nineteen and before uh, <laughs> the uh, racial injustice things uh, uh, became came to the front. Perhaps it still is. I think a lot of people see the racial issues as a side effect of, of, of that. a larger problem of inequality. And so there are proposed wealth taxes there. There's talk of, of reparations to descendants of slaves. There is the broader issues of the climate, right? Climate change. There, there are extremely different perspectives on climate change. And you have, oddly, it's devolved into what seems to be a dichotomy when it is not a dichotomy at all, where you have one side is presented as not believing in climate change. And the other side is depend is presented as believing in science and climate change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and the idea is that there's one option if you believe climate change is happening. And there's one option if you believe it isn't. And, and so you have two choices. Yeah. Like you have an enormous scientific field with competing ideas about millions of details about that, one of the most complex factors that we try and look at, which is weather. <laughs> and there's one solution and there's one counter thing, which is to not believe it at all. Yeah. It's such a silly, it, it, it's, 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 it's a product of a two party system, right? Where you have, one party yeah, offers. You can a only have two ideas. There's <laughs> only room two for ideas. two ideas. Yeah, and that's and that's it. That's true of immigration and these wealth taxes as well. It's a, it's either yes or no. It's a it's this or this, and mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. just. And when you get into it, it's it can be a lot more interesting if you can free yourself from that, from those, from path A and path B, and realize that there's a whole world of ideas, and we would love to get into climate change. They they talked about climate change. As part of what segment? The climate change <laughs> segment, don't you remember? <laughs> I'm looking back at our notes on the broader segment. There was no climate change segment, but they, they, they sure get into it at times as they talk about the fires in California. Yeah, and they, and they brought it up, but they never actually talked about it. You know, there's a difference between bringing it up as a, as a catchphrase, as something to get to stick to the other side, you know. Yes. Yeah. As you don't, you know, you're a climate change denier as the label that we're trying to get to stick as an example is very different from actually talking about climate change and about what that means. The economy. You could talk about economic theory and why the economy works in certain ways and draw upon millions of data points to make your case or or even i mean let's 
we, we understand the realities of, of an election and, and, and the right. realities uh, of convincing people. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but even even on a more realistic level, talking about specific things that Donald Trump has done and how they've affected the economy and specific things that Biden has done and how they've affected the economy and specific things that they're going to do to affect the economy. Even that would be a much more relevant discussion. It's incredibly relevant to, once again, this this debate is about which candidate would be a serve as a better president. Instead, because you remember they did have a section on the economy, the V-shape or the K-shape. So what did that discussion mostly involve? It mostly involved arguing whether the economy was better during Trump's presidency or Obama's presidency without ever discussing Number one, what that even means, the economy being better, most of the time they were arguing a set of numbers. You know, they go this number, that number, this number, that number. And then even if those numbers are useful, they never talk about what either presidency did to affect those numbers. They talked as if those numbers were a direct result of Trump getting elected. Like Trump talked as if as soon as he got elected, <laughs> jobs started sprouting out of the ground as this this miracle. And and that when Obama was was president, there was this drought that was immediately there as a direct result of him being president. Like that's how that's how they talked. And then of course it was swapped for the other side. <laughs> It's just there's there's no tangible connection with what they were saying to the real issues, which once again is how they're affecting the economy, which as Dan's saying, the best way to talk about that is to actually discuss economic theory because you need to understand how cause and effect works so that we can connect these two two ideas. Many, many, many books have been written on this subject. Brad's Brad's absolutely right. You don't present a book in a debate. You don't present a case for a theory that takes into account many points of data in such a circumstance. But you can at least suggest it. You can you can propose the simplified principles and give an example or two. You could you could say <laughs> you could say this is the fact. This is why this fact is important because it demonstrates this principle. This principle is what I believe in and that's how I I think about the economic process and and it works and here's why and and you can you can get into this relationship between what i think what the facts are and how you're interpreting those facts so that people can follow the reasoning Mm -hmm. they could say Mm -hmm. this leads to this leads to this thus i am a good president or i am a good candidate no, and, and that's an excellent point that economic theory sounds very ambitious, but when explained simply and clearly, it can it doesn't be, have to be, it doesn't yeah. have to be, it can be Re- effective. You know, I mean, we've, we've talked about economics a couple of times in this episode, some more complicated economic ideas and, and we're able to, to discuss them effectively. We thought, you know, go ahead and, and take a listen and, and let us know if you disagree. <laughs> <laughs> right, a lot of a lot of what we're doing when we talk about a state of nature, when we talk about Brad and is, I just, is simplifying it. Is is economic theory presented in brief examples about just life and the way people are motivated and how how interactions work? It's it doesn't have like you said, it doesn't have to be complicated. Now you could write books getting into the nuances of it, but they don't, and they they shouldn't do that. And they shouldn't present massive amounts of information in these debate formats, but and they don't have to. But they should present some way for us to track what they think and what they're going to do to what happened <laughs> yeah. and to what and to the <laughs> outcomes. Like there's, if there is not a connection between any of those things, they're just stating random facts from a pool of literally millions you could draw from from different data sets. And resting their whole gives... campaign on those facts. <laughs> right, right. Uh, what is the job growth of of uh, an example of this was the job growth of Obama of, excuse me, in the Obama agency, jobs grew more in the first three years of his presidency than in the first three years of Trump's presidency. Okay. Assuming that's true. What does it mean? 
Well, I don't know. It depends on where they started, right? It depends mm-hmm. on on how low were jobs at the time and why were they that low? Was there was there a COVID nineteen? Was there a what was happening? What what did the president do that affected that? Yes, you know, yes, that is that is the question that almost never happen. gets addressed. <laughs> right, right. There's a billion things that affect the economy, including the weather. And <laughs> <laughs> is yeah, is the economy is 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 a uh, is obviously a very complicated. And so, just saying the economy was a certain way when you took office doesn't doesn't actually tell us much about how good of a president you are. We need more. Uh, it, we need more. It could tell us nothing. The economy could get better while you're doing all kinds of things to cause it problems. Mm-hmm. Because there's just so many factors that go into it. And 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 things like yeah, like like cause and effect taking time. You know, there <laughs> yeah. there's there's a real argument to be made for presidents benefiting from previous presidents economic decisions that they had nothing to do with but and we're not and we're we're not trying to get into the nuance of that right now just the point is that it's you need to talk about what you've done what you believe what you're going to do and how that connects to the economy and that's something that you can do in a debate format effectively but once again they're choosing not to yeah they're choosing not to instead they're choosing to talk about (laughs) Cherry pick statistics that tr- that try and make their cause look good or the opponent's cause look bad. Mm-hmm. Criminal justice reform uh, was it even discussed in any form? Did we see any criminal justice mentioned? I, I don't, don't think so. I don't remember any mention of it. I don't remember it. if it was. It was in passing. The question of good information out there versus bad information, false information versus true information. Um, Hate speech versus uh, non-hate speech. All of these issues about what should be allowed to be said and how it interacts with platforms and how it interacts with with uh, election tampering and like there's lots of things around the question of free speech that are big debates between theorists that that are having a large impact on groups like uh, like Black Lives Matter and uh, and the that racism questions and none of that seems to be to have tracked into this debate at all. None of it seems to be there at all. Yeah. And, and here's, and here's, and here's the next thing that we want to talk about is, uh, is, is what's even more surprising is both of these candidates have specific policies and plans that they're going to enact, or they say they're going to enact. They want to enact, right? They want to do things. And they've talked about things they want to do in their campaign. So obviously they're comfortable talking about these things. But for some reason in this debate, they didn't talk about them. And there's there's a few of them, you know, like Biden's climate change plan. Um, yeah, you know, it was mentioned, uh, never discussed. N- mentioned. I, I, I learned nothing about what's in it from that debate. The one that surprised me the most was Trump's platinum plan for black Americans that he, that his campaign just announced recently. I mean, it was, it's a matter of days, not weeks at this point that it's been announced and this big plans, like $500 billion that he wants to spend. And it has several different areas that he talks about making significant changes to improve the lives of black Americans. And then in this debate, Chris Wallace says, okay, we've got a 15 minute segment about race relations go. And I'm like, okay, the first thing Trump's going to say, I have a plan. I just rolled out this plan. This plan is literally designed to make me look good to a key demographic that I have spent a ton of time trying to capture this election. So why would I not talk about it? Right? I mean, it's, I can't think of a reason. I cannot think (laughs) of a reason. Even, even from the perspective of the game. No, especially from the perspective of the game. Especially from the perspective of the game. (laughs) Why Why would you not bring it up? And he does not mention it once, not only in that segment, but in the entire debate. He never brings up his platinum plan. And I'm like, why did you roll it out if you're not going to try and use it to get votes? I don't understand. I was baffled. I was truly, truly baffled why Trump never brought that plan up. I, I, I still don't know. Tell me why, Dan. Why did he not bring that up? Because it makes no sense to me. I, I, I don't know. It would have been, it would have gotten into actual policies he proposes and reflected some of the ways 
that he thinks are the way to go about helping in this situation. It would have been interesting. It would have, it would have told you something about his principles, even if he didn't talk about it and about his theory. And it, and it would have done everything he wanted to do in terms of trying to sway votes. I don't know why he didn't mention it. I, I'm as confused as you are. It doesn't make any <laughs> sense. It should have been, not only should it have been, should it, not only should he have mentioned it, he should have mentioned it at every moment he could. Yeah, it should have, he should have beat it into the ground, which he could have, you know, he could have every, every time it went back to him, just kept bringing it up. And that's, and if, if I were Trump, that's what I would have done. And, and it's interesting, you know, we talk about avoiding specifics. It makes more sense for Biden to avoid specifics than for Trump to avoid specifics. You know, especially if you go back mm-hmm. to their overarching plans, their overarching plans for this election. You know, after watching the DNC, after watching the RNC, you can see that when you talk about the game, the Democrats are going to, their plan is kind of, their plan is not Trump. Is, is not Trump. In many ways, it's not Trump. And so the more vague they are, the better off they are. Right. They draw a contrast in character. They say, they say empathy and those kind of things. Yeah. Exactly. Trump's plan, though, is in many ways, don't listen to what I say, look at what I do. And so if that were my, my brand, my, my platform is look at what I do. I would spend most of my time talking about what I'm doing and what I'm going to do, and that would mean bringing up your plans, especially a plan designed to make you look good. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's strange. It's strange. That was that was clearly a tactical error even from the perspective of the game and not just from our we actually want substance viewpoint. You know, and we we already hit on this idea earlier, but I w- I want to talk about it for just a minute, and it's the idea of this obsession with with specific details and specific facts, and attaching great weight to them. And this is not something that we see just in the debate; we see it everywhere in the political world. And it's this this newfound fad of fact checking, and I call it a fad which is obviously derogatory, which shows you a little bit where I'm coming from. <laughs> but let me explain explain why. I mean, our podcast is about thinking and it's about finding truth. So obviously, truth and facts are important to us. They are incredibly important to us. And so it's weird that fact-checking has, has become such that fact-checking can sometimes get in the way of finding out what people are actually saying. And and the reason that happens is because fact checking is 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 mostly subjective, you know. Fact checking it either either gives it the the thumbs up or the thumbs down. It's true or it's false, right? And and it's usually one sentence or one phrase or one word that they focus on instead of trying to figure out what the idea is behind it. So you'd think that that. If you're checking a fact, you'd say the fact is accurate or it isn't. And you would look and, and, and this fact has a historic, historical basis. And you check what is said against what happened, accounts of what happened. And you say, that's not what happened. This is, or you'd say, yeah, that is, that is pretty much what happened or with this detail left out or compare what's said with factual claim with the actual facts, and it would be that straightforward. And it's not that straightforward. It's not nearly that straightforward. Because words convey ideas, and you can't get outside of the fact that you must interpret the words and interpret the facts. And so you said that judging facts is actually quite subjective, and it is quite subjective. And the irony is that so many fact-checking groups... What you'd think is, is what they're doing is they're telling you whether an article is accurate, but they're not. They're writing another article about the article <laughs> so that they can spin their viewpoint into it. And, and when you start to think of it that way, it gives you a, it gives you a lens through which you can say, I'm going to talk about whether this is right in an objective way. But the interpretation, the interpretive aspect is such that any biases you have are still going to be there in the fact-checking. It's not like 
Politicians are subjective and fact checkers are objective. That's not how it works. Both are subjective and both are going through the same, the same issues. And I think part of the problem is that, is that we're talking about more than facts. We're talking about ideas. Here's an example. Biden said that the president has no plan for the coronavirus pandemic, right? That, that's what he said. And so that statement gets fact checked and they look at well, what, what, what plan did Trump have and whether or not that qualifies enough to justify Biden saying that, right? The problem is, is that the president has no plan. Biden saying that is not really a statement of fact. It's a statement of an idea. Biden is saying that, I mean, because as, as Dan put earlier, the president has no plan if taken at face value is obviously untrue. Because Trump did something, which means he had to have some kind of plan. What Biden right. is really saying. He looked really at the situation. Saying, he, just say, he said, what should I do in this circumstance? He came up with what he should do and he executed it. Yeah. And that's. If that's not a plan, I don't know what the word plan means. Exactly. Exactly. What Biden's saying is that Trump didn't have a good plan. That his plan was so bad, he may as well have not had a plan. And so if you fact check that, what you've ended up doing is as Dan saying is is starting to decide whether or not Biden's ideas are right or wrong. And it's something that a lot of conservatives are getting upset about fact checkers because a large chunk of the media has decided that Trump is just therefore when Trump says something most likely what he's saying is going to be false because the ideas behind it are wrong. And <laughs> And that's where you get into this idea of fact checking being ineffective because now we're not fact checking, we're idea checking. We're saying, okay, your ideas are wrong. Yeah. And and that's not the role of a fact checker, that's a role of the of of a competing party. And <laughs> and now now you have fact checkers who are taking sides. I mean, just as you have media that are taking sides in this cultural war between these two parties. Right. And and that's really our concern with with the fact checking idea is that we're focusing on on the wrong thing. And then the other problem with fact checking as we talked about before we've already hit on this is that often these these numbers, these facts in isolation don't have as much significance as people think they do. You know, we talked about the jobs earlier. Whether or not those numbers are accurate is a lot less important than you would think. Because as we talked about, first of all, those are just one number in a huge economy of numbers. And on top of that, even if that one number happened to represent the entire economy, it doesn't answer any relevant question about what those presidents have actually done. Right. And that's what matters. So many, of the, so much of the time, the fact checkers is spent checking facts that if they're true or they fall or they are false, it doesn't matter. It doesn't actually change anything, and that's it crazy. Anything. It is crazy. Well, I wanted to add one detail to what you were you were saying with the first point about it being subjective is that the people when you say fact checking, what comes to mind is someone who says the Civil War happened in the 1960s, <laughs> and they're off by a hundred years, right? You you go you a fact checker goes and says. That date seems odd. They consult a history book of any kind or Google it, right? And they go, yeah, that person's wrong. That's not the year that it happened. And that kind of fact checking does still go on right next to idea checking. And if you don't realize there's a big difference and that one of these is subjective and one of these is more objective, you know, one of these is a, is a does the date, does the factual claim line up? Was he there at 7 p.m.? on this night is a fact that you should be checking if you're a police officer investigating a murder or whatever. There are facts that are that are worth checking, you know. Trump goes over there and he accuses, you know, Joe Biden's son of getting three point five million dollars from a Russian mayor. That's a statement of fact, and I think fact checkers should go in and say, here's the evidence, take a look at this article that discusses it, and, and here's information and data about what actually happened, and we'll try and help you find the facts. Fantastic. Biden says the president has no plan. We don't need fact checkers. We need a, a discussion. You know what I mean? A discussion about <laughs> right. 
what the right. president's plan was and whether or not it was a good one. They're two totally right. different cases. Yeah, these things are not alike, and they and the, what they need is different. And and people treat them as if you can fact check that. And so, uh, <laughs> these fact checking groups have a lot of different labels. They'll say things like true, mostly true, some true, some false, mostly false, false needs context depending on which site you're looking at or which group they might have others. But here's another example of, of something that they fact checked on one of these sites. Trump said, if you had good forest management, you wouldn't be getting calls that California is on fire. That's a, a slight paraphrase because he says some other things in there, but that's the idea. If you had good forest management, you wouldn't be getting calls that California is on fire. Now this group rated that claim false because climate change affects fires. Yeah, because climate changes are a substantial cause for the fires. And so it's it's more than just forage man forest management. It's because of climate change. Therefore, that statement was false. Now, if you want to make that claim, you need more <laughs> than a citation that climate change affects the environment. Because the direct cause of any particular fire is going to be a very complicated question. Now, you, the proximate cause would be easy. You could say a lightning bolt struck here or a someone didn't put out their fire, right? That's the proximate cause. That's the thing that actually lit a fire. That's mm -hmm. That you can find and you can fact check and you can say this is what lit the fire if, if the situation allows you to discover what it is exactly. But the ultimate cause of it and how much of the fire is dependent on poor management and how much is, you know, what percentage of the, like, how do you assign, how do you mm -hmm. even begin to break that down and say mm -hmm. the climate accounts for 25% of the ultimate causation? There's no path through the reasoning that would get you to that conclusion and be able to say that. And it's where we come back to again, that it's not about facts, it's about ideas. There are two competing ideas here. Well, there are more competing ideas, but in this case, you've got Trump on one hand and the fact checkers on the other. Trump is saying the primary cause for these fires is bad management. The fact checkers are saying the primary cause of these fires is climate change. And, and there's not one fact that you can go check in a book to verify either side because it's incredibly nuanced. First of all, we're not even talking about one fire. We're talking about hundreds of different fires that have occurred in the past few months. And the reasons could be very different for each of those fires. And what we're saying is that the fact checkers are not checking facts. They're simply arguing ideas with Trump, but claiming that they're checking facts. And that's right. the issue. Right, because if you wanted to check the facts of that and really come to some kind of a, a, a conclusion based on empirical fact, you would probably have to dedicate your life to that question and you would have to be an expert. You would have to become an expert in, in the climate and in forest management and go and investigate these fires individually and come together on some like, well, this one, this was the factor here and this one here are the factors here. And like, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. what they're discarding there in these few claims as fact checkers, I guarantee they are not fit to make those judgments. <laughs> and yeah. Like, like who, who are these fact checkers that they're experts in this and understand the causation here in this fire and from a diverse variety of factors enough to say that this is the primary cause. Now, and you can make the same case for Trump, right? Trump is stating a, a belief about an idea based on certain evidence. And you could, you could review the evidence, say, what evidence is there that, that, it's the, it's the management of this. And I think there's a strong case to be made there based on comparing different forest fires in different states. Because if the climate is the primary effect, right, then you would see it playing out across all the states and you aren't, you're seeing it play across only a very few. And anyway, and so that's, you know, that's a, that's one of the many facts and ideas you would have to take into account as you were trying to do this analysis. And so for the fact checker to come out and say, no, this is it. Trump's claim is false. And to do it in a few paragraphs can't be done. Something is terribly wrong there. They're, they, yeah. If they think that they know the answer to that question, they don't know how much they don't know. No, and, and that was the crazy thing because I, I, I read that 
that fact check and you know what they never mentioned is a uh, is a uh, California's uh, forest management because he's arguing that uh, the, the the thing that caused it was their forest management being bad and that fact check never even talked about their forest management <laughs> Like I, right, which I, you'd have to do because I'm actually, have to do that because I, I I read that and I'm curious I'm like is there forest management bad is it good how important is forest management fires I have no idea I I would like to I would like to know a little bit more about this and you'd think a fact check would be a good place to find out a little bit more about the facts about forest management and the connection with forest fires because they could have said hey. For the for the past ten years, you know, California's had these fires that their forest management has been able to put out consistently, and then this year's different, and so it's not because of forest management, and that would have been an interesting fact that helped me understand Trump's statement. Right, that it wouldn't have been proof, there. but it would have been evidence. Yeah, yeah, it would have been some evidence, and and if they provided some evidence and said, therefore, we think. You know, they they say this, this, so yeah, and this. then and then maybe they said yeah, yeah, maybe his statement is is dubious because of that. But right, the- right, there appears to be evidence to the contrary, right? That would be if that was what the fact checker's conclusion was. I'd say, good to know. Thank you for that useful information. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But there, that's not what they're doing. And if you can't see that, there's a. That yeah. not only do they have certain assumptions, but there's a reason to politically spin it that way and to say what Trump said about forest fires in California is, is proof that he doesn't believe in climate change and therefore doesn't believe in science. If you can't see that there's a political incentive to make that claim, then you are, then let me just say that you have a lot more faith in mankind than I do <laughs> because you can bet that our biases, that we have biases and that they show. And that they matter in our subjective determinations like this one. No, and I and I like the way you put that, Dan. I think that's a, a good note to end on for, for talking about fact checking is the idea that that a fact checker's goal should be to bring relevant information to help understand whether or not someone's statement is true. And if they're not doing that, then they're really not fact checking at that point. If I were running a fact checking thing, I would provide relevant information, some counter information if there is some, some support supporting information if there is some that I can find quickly. And then I would let whoever reads the fact check make a better decision with that information. Yeah, you don't need not to, tell them. You don't need to tell them what to think. Just say here here's more information right. that's relevant to help you understand the facts. Yeah. And that would be yeah. That would be really helpful. I would read that site. Give me the site that does that. I would love that. Sounds like we've got work to do. The most important part of why we're talking about this fact-checking is that at least half of the country, probably more than half the country, thinks that the primary problem with our politics today is that the other side of the country is reading false information and they don't realize it. Yeah, they don't know the true facts. They don't know the true facts. And and though most of the fact-checking groups I've seen are Democrats, the Republicans also believe that idea in their, in their side, right? They think that... that it's uh, that it's skewed media, right? It's media bias is there is the way they format it. And whereas the, the others are like, no, it's that they, they believe in all these fake things and they don't believe in science. And so both groups have a reason to think that the other side is completely ignoring the facts. I agree completely with that, that, uh, that it's, 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 as we talked about before, it's about ideas and principles yeah. And not about facts. Those are the differences and those are what need to be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. You you mentioned and we talked about this just a little bit, just Kenosha. If you want to say what are the facts of the case, you'd say, where is he at this time? Does he have a gun? You know, is someone chasing him? These are factual questions. As soon as you want to say, therefore, he's justified or he's not justified. You need more than the bare facts. Uh-huh. You're bringing uh-huh. you're bringing more than data to that question. You're making moral interpretations and interpretations about what justice means. Mm-hmm. You can't get from a date, the date of the Civil War, to the Civil War, to why the Civil War happened, yeah. without making more steps and getting into the realm. Like you were talking about the fact versus ideas. At that point, you're into the realm of ideas, and you need to do. You're not just fact checking. So obviously, what we're talking about here is 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 about a, a few different things. We're talking about ideas and political principles 
versus facts. We're talking about facts versus vagaries and mudslinging and talking about how disappointing this debate has been on a much broader scale that is more a reflection of the way politics works today than a reflection of the two candidates who are up there. And and as we are talking about this and thinking about this this week, it was a little bit disheartening because as Dan said, there's so many things we wanted to talk about and so many ideas that people are interested in that aren't getting talked about. And yeah, things and we, that matter. Things that matter, things that really matter, things that affect people in a large way and that need to be addressed and that we expect the government to to deal with. These are issues not not that we expect them to deal with, that they are dealing with. The government is acting in each of those areas. You know, we we listed a, a, a list of issues above, you know, immigration, taxation on the wealth, climate change, the economy, criminal justice reform, free speech as just a handful of the major issues that are out there that the government is dealing with and is affecting our lives on a regular basis that the politicians who are deciding those things aren't even willing to talk about. And listening to a debate doesn't even address them. So where does that leave us? It leaves a hole, right? It leaves a hole. And so what we want to do and what we would like to do going forward, since since we're not going to get the real conversations from these debates that we wanted to have, so we're just going to have them anyways, is is if they're not going to talk about the real issues, then we'll just do it for them. So going forward, we will continue to hit on hit on the debates. I mean, next week will be the vice presidential debate. I believe that is still going forward. We'll see what happens about the two presidential debates after that. I don't know what what's going to happen with the 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 current the current situation with with the president and covid but but regardless regardless of what happens with the debates going forward we're still going to address those and we're still going to address what's happening but we're also going to take this time to talk about the issues that we think they should be talking about and we invite you to do the same so so if there are any issues that you have questions about if there are any issues where you disagree with us or you've listened to an episode before where we talked about something, you know, whether it's restorative justice or, you know, definitions on race, capitalism, uh, the war on drugs, um, police reform. We've talked about a lot of things. Man, look at us go. Um, <laughs> anything, then hit us up and ask your questions. Say, hey, you guys talked about this, but but what about this? You never addressed this side of that issue, and I want to have that side addressed. Mm -hmm. Let us know, and that way we can have a discussion about it and get a little bit deeper into something we've already talked about or talk about something new that people are interested in. Because if you're listening to this podcast, most likely you are someone who is concerned about these issues that aren't getting brought up, and you're looking for a place where you can actually have that conversation. And so we'd like to have that opportunity here. And if you are listening to this podcast, as Brad said, you probably are looking for this kind of thing. Share this podcast, find others like us. There are other groups who are doing the same thing, who are people who, who actually want to have the conversation, right? We would not be hurt at all if you said, hey, it's I disagree with you on this for this reason. We would love to talk about that and be like, well, and here's probably what we'd say, probably like, that's a good reason to disagree. This is a complicated <laughs> issue, right? And, yeah, and, and there's going to be disagreement and talk always. About, and, like there's... One of the most useful things that we've learned to, to try and do is to, to try and make the strongest case for opinions that you are opposed to. So you take, you take something you don't like and you say, I think this is a bad argument, but what if I made it stronger? What if, what would be the best argument for that position that I disagree with? And you, you'd be surprised how much you can learn from mm -hmm. if you will mm -hmm. stop straw manning and start steel manning. Your opponent's <laughs> arguments. Start listening. Find the people who really believe it and who can make the strong case for it and listen to them. There are a lot of people who are thinking independently about political issues. They've studied it out. They're looking beyond A or B solutions. And they, if you meet one of those people, 
find them in a podcast or, or see them on the street, talk to them about it because you will learn something. You can learn something about any of these issues, even from people you, whether you agree with that person or disagree with them, if they are thinking about it independently and not merely giving these talking points, not merely reduced to this political game. And, you, and you'll find that that's time, if you're interested in those issues, that will be time well spent in ways that watching this debate wasn't. <laughs> in ways that watching, in the ways that watching most of Fox News and MSNBC is not going to be. Well put, Dan. So with that, thank you for listening. And if you have the opportunity, hit us up at rethinkingpoliticspodcast at gmail.com. And we will see you all next week. Till next time.